And so let's go ahead and get into the Sunday School lesson, Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to be starting uh, looking at today verses 28 through 30, continuing the idea of God's calling for the husband. This has been a, a very interesting, in-depth study of this subject, and we still haven't hit on all the different aspects of the marriage relationship, the husband and the wife, uh, because we're trying to stay in the context of the passage. This is supposed to be an expository uh, Sunday school lesson of the passage that we're going through, and so I'm trying not to go into all these tangents and, and off on these rabbit trails. So. It's uh, been difficult, and so we're, we're here focusing on verses 28 through 30. And to get our context, let's go ahead and start in verse 25. <clears throat> he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. Let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we get to spend in your word. We ask that you'll bless the time that we're together, that you'll bless the time that we're in your word, and that <clears throat> all of us will have an attentive ear to your word and what it has for us to learn and to apply to our lives, and that you give me clarity of thought and speech, that we'll all be able to understand it clearly. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. And so we're going to be looking at verses 28 through 30, but let's do a little bit of review that we're going through a paragraph right now dealing with interpersonal relationships encompassing verses 22 of chapter 5 through chapter 6, verse 9. And he's addressing th uh, three major relationship paradigms here between the husband and the wife and between the parents and the children and then between uh, the master and servant. And last Sunday, during Sunday school and, and during second hour, uh, we studied verses 26 through 27. It's amazing how two verses, and it was able to... Uh, take up both hours last week because pastor was out sick. Uh, and there, Paul addressed the husband's treatment of his wife while relating his relationship to the relationship of Christ with the church. <clears throat> During that first hour, we reviewed an important rule to prevent the Christian from improperly interpreting similes and types and parables, as well as providing some cases in which uh, it can be dangerous to wrongly apply them. Uh, we saw why, throughout this epistle to the Ephesians, Paul refers to the church as a physical, tangible place where believers assemble with each other to meet with God. And we talked about uh, the different types of churches throughout history and how uh, there will be one final uh, church where we all meet together with Christ in heaven. Uh, we saw how the church, uh, where and how people have assembled to meet with God, has changed throughout history. And we saw that the purpose of our Lord saving his church is for the purpose of his glory. And this is also his purpose for the institution of marriage. That we don't just get married so that we can procreate or so that we can have companionship. Uh, we are married for the glory of Christ, our Lord. Uh, we also saw the importance of the husband focusing on leading his family to glorify God the best that they can as well as some ways in which he could help his wife uh, to glorify God the best that she can. Then during our second meeting, we saw our, that our Lord's intent for the church is to glorify him when it's presented to himself during what I believe will be the marriage supper of the Lamb, when all the saints of all ages are resurrected and brought together to meet together with our Lord at once. And they'll continue to meet with him in one place, uh, throughout eternity, uh, whether that's in earth or in heaven. Uh, and maybe there's two places, maybe some meet on earth and some meet in heaven. Uh, we don't necessarily, we're not spelled out all the details in the word of God, but the point is that all the saints will be gathered together. And we not just local, different, uh, visible bodies uh, as we see today. And we saw that this passage indicates that Christ is working on the church 
to have it prepared for this event. And that preparation for this event should also be the goal of the husband with his wife and family, with their children. And we saw that the necessary tool to accomplish this preparation of the church and of the family uh, is the Word of God. And we saw what the term sanctify and cleanse refer to, and we defined those. Uh, and we saw the term spot and wrinkle. And so today, we're going to be studying verses 28 through 30, where the husband's relationship with his wife is still being compared to Christ's relationship with the church. And uh, so first, I want us to see here in verse 28 that Christ illustrates his selfless and his sacrificial love for the church through his life and death on, uh, of himself on the behalf of the church. Uh, earlier in verses 25 through 27, men loving their wives is compared to our Lord loving the church by dying for it and preparing it to be a glorious offering to himself. That's the point of verses 25 through 27. Now in verses 28 through 31, men loving their, li their wives is compared to our Lord loving the church by nourishing and caring for it because they're one. It's a different idea. The first idea was a preparation uh, for uh, that future event. And then in the second idea of the verses 28 through 30 is, is the idea of them being one and caring for the church because he is one with the church and the husband caring for his wife because he is one with her. As our Lord is the head of the body of the church, the husband is the head of the wife. As the Lord, is per as the Lord has perfectly nourished and cared for the church, as one does his own body, so the husband is commanded to nourish and to care for his wife. Uh, being members of the same body also refers to the idea of being one entity or unit. Uh, as the head is part of the body, both the head and the body are intertwined and inter interdependent, and both are mutually concerned with one another's well-being. Okay? If, the, if the head dies, the body dies. If uh, part of the body dies, there's a good chance that the head might die. And so their, their concerns are, uh, are intertwined. Uh, Christ and the church are one body, Christ being the head and the church being the body. Uh, they are one entity or unit. Uh, they're intertwined and interdependent, and they're being mutually concerned for one another. The husband and the wife are also, at marriage, made one entity or unit. Uh, they're made to be intertwined and interdependent, and they're made to be mutually concerned for one another. That is what happens at marriage. And this is why Paul says, that he that loveth his wife loveth himself, in verse 28. Because the husband and the wife, metaphorically, here we have a metaphor, we, we talked about the importance of properly interpreting uh, similes, and, but also in the same uh, idea is the metaphor, that Christ is not saying uh, that he is literally a head. Okay? He is saying that he's metaphorically the head of the church. And so they metaphorically become uh, one flesh, the, the husband and the wife, they become one entity. Uh, that is, they are intertwined and interdependent. And so in this way, because they are one unit, if a man doesn't love his wife, it's the same as his not loving his own body. They're the same. They're one now. Also, this is why Paul says that the church members are also members of his flesh and of his bones. Our Lord designed the body as a perfect independent, I'm sorry, interdependent unit. Uh, no part of the body has its own skeletal structure or skin. I think that's the point here. Paul's point is that it matters if, that, if one part of the body is damaged or broken or detached. It matters to the rest of the body. If the skin of another body part is burned or cut, the whole body hurts and reacts and suffers. If a bone of another body part is broken or bruised, that whole body hurts, right? I mean, we've all had uh, bruises or, or bones that ache, and it's like you feel it all over your body. And the whole body reacts and suffers along with it. A person can't just detach and get rid of a part of his body without the whole body being impacted and suffering. 
And so we see there that idea of them being one, of uh, the, the idea of them being one body, being one unit, and interconnected. Uh, also, we see that a normal person takes care of his body. We should all understand that a normal person, we've seen some pretty screwed up things uh, where people will emaciate themselves and, and, and will do uh, crazy things to their own body, but we're not talking about that. Those are obviously not normal people. God has built into every person uh, the desire to care for his own body. The idea of nourish here refers to the idea of raising or caring for something like an animal or plants or children. Uh, like when you have a plant in your house, you nourish it by caring for it and providing for it and keeping it safe and helping to keep it healthy, to help it grow. Uh, this word is also translated in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 as bring up. He says, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I at first looked there for that verse thinking that it would be the same word as the word nurture, but it's not. It's uh, the same word as the word bringing them up. It's the, the idea of nourishing. Uh, this word relates to the idea of a husbandman and of a farm that he cares for and that he raises to be healthy and productive. Uh, the idea of the word cherish uh, refers to uh, caring for and treating uh, with affectionate solicitude. That's a, a good word that I stole from a commentator. Affectionate, affectionate solicitude. Uh, not just being affectionate, but also having solicitude, where you are, are caring for that thing above all else, and that has utmost concern to you. Uh, the word cherish carries the idea of the way a nursing mother treats her child, having the utmost concern for that child's happiness and success. Uh, this word is also used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, where he says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So as a mother cherishes her children, uh, so we see here that picture uh, for Christ and the church and for the husband with his wife. Uh, this word isn't, it's, it's an interesting word, the word cherish. It's not relating to the person's mentality that, oh, I cherish you. Well, that's the way we normally use it. Uh, but it's re relating to the person's resulting actions, the idea of being cherished, of uh, being taken care of uh, with utmost care uh, that you'll be happy and successful, that idea. So men don't <clears throat> hate their bodies, but they love them. Uh, a normal person has a healthy love for his body, which just simply refers to having a devotion to care for and to treat his body the best he can. Uh, God built into people that innate concern uh, to nourish their bodies. And a wise person realizes that his need for a healthy, fit, and able body is not just because it's the only body he has. It's not just because uh, that, so that that body can take care of itself, but it's also for that body to be as productive as possible uh, beyond just self-preservation. Uh, that's why we try to stay fit, is so that we can be productive, not just to stay alive. A, person, a normal person cherishes his body. He realizes uh, that it's not replaceable and that it's not easily reparable, if, especially if it gets so bad. Uh, a normal person realizes that if his body is permanently damaged by disease or by amputation or by a serious wound, uh, he has to deal with that for the rest of his life. And so a man nourishes and, and cherishes his own body. Our Lord has the same kind of care for the church, uh, loving it, nourishing it, and care, cherishing it. Our Lord has similar feelings toward each member of the local church. And he loves and nourishes and cherishes each and every member of the body of Christ. Uh, he wants what's best for each of the members. Go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, that Christ cares for what's best for everybody, for, every, for all the Christians, uh, and he gives some qualifications for that. In Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 28, he says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So there he gives some qualifications uh, for all things to work together for good to us. But the point is that as we 
love God and serve God in the church, that he will make everything work together for good uh, for us. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many, many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? That is a wonderful feeling that a Christian can have uh, when he has his Lord as his Savior. Uh, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And so there we have such kind of, that kind of cherishing of the Lord for the church. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? If it is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Now that's that, again, that idea of him cherishing us, that he is even in heaven right now interceding on our behalf. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That even, then, even when we go through hard trials and tribulations in our lives, we can still trust that God cherishes us. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, including myself, uh, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a wonderful love that exemplifies the idea of cherishing here. And Christ cherishes his church. And we can turn back to uh, Ephesians chapter 5 here. And Christ does everything perfectly to nourish and to care for each member of the church. He cherishes each member like a friend, like a son, and like a man would his own body. Every one of us can trust our Lord's perfect concern and care for us. Even when we're going through hard times like Job did, we can trust that all things will work together for good. Uh, even when we feel like Elijah did after Mount Carmel, where all those prophets were killed in front of him, but then he fled from Jezebel and got discouraged and, fell and told God to kill him. Even when we're in positions like Paul was, when he mentioned all the afflictions, he went through a grocery list of all the afflictions that he faced in this life in God's service. And even though he went through all those hard times, and all three of these people went through a lot of trouble because of their commitment uh, to Christ, their love for Christ, uh, their uh, commitment to the church and to the Lord's will. And they still faced such hard trials, but, but they still trusted that God cherished them, that they could serve their God, and he will work everything out for their good. <clears throat> and so we must also trust that if we are obeying and serving and glorifying our Lord, all that happens to us is also by design. And it happens because our Lord loves us. He cherishes us, and he, cher and he, he nourishes each and every one of us as members of his church. Also, in application, not just that the Lord uh, has that same view toward the church, but also the Lord expects the husband to have that same kind of care for his wife. Uh, husbands are to understand that their calling is similar uh, to the, our Lord's, that they should also be nourishing and cherishing their wives in love. Uh, as much as a man cares for his own cleanliness and his own nourishment, his own health, his own protection, uh, he should also care for his wife's well-being because they are, one, uh, they are one body. They are one entity. This concern is deeper than the idea of a wife's coverture or safety. We talked about the idea of coverture of the husband over the wife and, and his family and the idea of him being the savior of the body, of his concern for their safety. Uh, this is also being concerned for her health, for her happiness, for her comfort, for her concerns and for her relationship with God. It, re it re refers to a lot more than just keeping her physically safe. This also includes the husband communicating with the wife, listening to his wife, and even being attentive to his wife's needs and her desires and her plans. Uh, when the head, for instance, notices that the body part is acting sluggish 
or it's acting wrong, or it's in pain. The head is attentive and acts quickly to take care of what's causing the issue with that body part. And since the wife is the weaker vessel, as referred to in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, the husband should also give her even more honor and care as a body part that's weaker and more fragile, that needs more care of the husband. And so the husband should be giving that extra care to his wife. The husband must cherish his wife, being affectionate to her and caring most about her success, her joy, her peace, and more importantly, her glorification of her Lord. That's the whole point of this passage. Uh, His wife should know that he cares most for her and that he wants what's best for her, not just because he tells her, but because he shows it and what he does for her and, and what he does to her and, and what he, uh, how he acts around her. Uh, when his wife is having trouble uh, or is discouraged or is distraught or she's physically worn down, the husband should fill in the gap and make up the work needed because she is the weaker vessel. Uh, like when a man has his arm that's uh, bruised or broken, uh, without giving it much thought, he naturally nourishes and cherishes that body part more. So that, uh, and, and so in that same way, the man should do so for his wife, helping her and encouraging her to be stronger, while at the same time helping her when, she, when, uh, when there's more than that she can handle. So he's encouraging her to be stronger, doing what he can to strengthen her, and at the same time helping her with the things that she can't handle. What comes to my mind when I think about this subject is uh, is Sherry having the baby uh, coming and how she's so tired so often and how uh, sometimes uh, she's not able to keep up with all the tasks that she has at hand. And I, as a husband, should be responsible to help to make up what needs to be done and to help her with those concerns and with the tasks that she has as a wife and as a mother. If the husband wants to have a biblical marriage that glorifies God, which is the whole point of marriage, and he wants to have a biblical wife that glorifies God, he must care for his wife as much as he cares for himself. That's the point of the text. Next, I want us to shift gears and talk about the Lord's care for the church. I want us to notice in verses 23 through 32, the Lord's care for the church. Uh, when we studied verse 25, I mentioned uh, during two different Sunday school lessons that there's something for everyone to learn from a passage. Okay, when he's talking about the husband, he's not just, uh, that doesn't mean that the wife and the children can shut their ears. Uh, today, we're going to see that there's something in this passage with which the rest of the church should be concerned, besides the relationship between the husband and the wife. Uh, Paul says in verse 32 that his focus is not just on the relationship of the husband and the wife, but also on the local church. Okay, the point of this passage is not just dealing with the husband and wife's relationship. It's dealing with the church and its relationship with Christ. Uh, This passage is um, also parallel to Ephesians chapter 3. Go ahead and turn there. And we already studied through this. Uh, this chapter, but this is a parallel idea. We're here talking about the importance of the church to every Christian. Ephesians chapter 3, <clears throat> starting in verse 21. At the, end of the, at the end of the chapter, he says, Unto him, God, our Father, be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world, within, world without end. And that idea is the focus on the church, that our church should be focused on glorifying Christ, not just now, but in the future. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. They're talking about the vocation wherewith you're called in the church, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, one another in the church, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And then he talks about there being one body, uh, one spirit. And, uh, and then he goes on to say in verse 10, he says, He that descended is the same also that ascended far up above all, all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And what was the purpose for these offices in the church? 
for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no, men, no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, the head of the body, the church. He's here talking about in the context of the church. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And so we there see the importance of the church to the Christian. And we already went over all that in that passage. But I want us to notice here in chapter 5, in verse 23, we see in verse 23 that Christ's headship is over those in the church and that his headship is displayed through his treatment of his church. Notice the focus is on the headship of Christ over the church. In verse 23, you also see that Christ's salvation, referring to the sanctification and safety of the Christian, is provided through the church. In verse 25, we see that our Lord's love and his sacrificial death were for, he doesn't say the Christian, he says the church. In verse 26, our Lord's cleansing and sanctification of the saints is through the church. It's to the church. In verse 26, we also see that the Lord's cleansing and sanctification occurs when the word of God is applied to the church. It's what purifies the church. Verse 27, the saints glorified the Lord as a church. In verse 27, we also see that our Lord's focus is on preparing the saints through the church for eternity. And in verse 29, we see that our Lord nourishes and cherishes what? The church. So by application, the Christian who is forsaking the assembly of the church, in verse 23, Paul is saying that he rejects Christ's headship, along with what that entails of himself. In verse 23, he's also saying that that Christian rejects our Lord's method of sanctification and protection over that Christian. In verse 25, it also means that that Christian is failing to realize the importance of his membership and his attendance in the church. In verse 26, that Christian real, uh, is uh, said to be rejecting the method that our Lord has provided for his cleansing and for his sanctification, because it happens in the church. In verse 26, it says that that Christian who is forsaking the assembling with the church rejects the exhortation of the saints and the teaching and preaching of God's word, which is the greatest way for the Lord to sanctify and to cleanse that Christian. In verse 27, it says that that Christian also cannot glorify his Lord properly as his Lord intends for him to glorify his Lord. In verse 27, is he's saying that that Christian who rejects the method, uh, who rejects the, the church, who is forsaking the assembly, is also rejecting the method through which he can best be prepared to, open, to ultimately glorify his Lord. And in verse 29, that Christian is rejecting his Lord's care for him by his rejecting his nurturing and caring of and, and cherishing of him. And so in this passage, Paul is making it clear that our Lord cares for the members of the church. He wants us to prioritize the church. Uh, the Lone Ranger Christian can't live outside the body of Christ. He's being disobedient to the Lord's command for him to assemble with believers. And he's outside of his prescribed sphere of authority that Christ has commanded him to be under. He is also outside of his now natural and needed environment. The Christian needs the church, and he now naturally should crave to be in the church, to be among the brethren, and to hear the preaching and teaching of the truth of God's word. That Christian is also without our Lord's prescribed methods of cleansing and sanctification and nourishment. And that Christian needs the church, just as much as the church needs the Christian. Paul said in chapter 4, verse 12, that without the church, 
the Christian cannot properly be perfected or to be ministered to or to be edified. And this is also why Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says that the Christian is not to forsake the assembling with the brethren. <clears throat> also, I want us to see that the Christian can't just detach himself from the local church, which is the body of Christ, on a whim, without legitimate reason, and without due process. Uh, that Christian is then dismembering or ripping off a part of the body of Christ, which Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 22, calls a necessary member. All of us that are members of the church are necessary members. We can't just detach ourselves because we have a qualm with somebody else or because we don't like something in the church. Both the Christian and the church are now one entity. When that Christian is baptized and he joins that church at that point, uh, he is then intertwined and interdependent on the church. And he must be concerned with the church and with the other members of the church. The Christian also can't just attend a church without becoming a member. Uh, this is also disobedience, just like when one refuses to be baptized, because you join the church through baptism. And so if you disobey your Lord to be baptized, as you're called to be, uh, you're also disobeying him by not being a member of a church. Uh, that Christian is outside of his prescribed sphere of authority. A lot of people today don't want to join a church because they don't want that sphere of, of authority uh, that, that Christ has instituted through the church. Uh, also, that Christian is a loose cannon without checks and balances and without accountability to the church. If that person just comes and goes, it's fine because he's not a member of the church. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, he's supposed to be accountable to a local body of Christ. And that Christian is depriving himself and his family of the Lord's blessings of being a member of the body of Christ. We should understand that attendance and membership are two different things. One doesn't become a member of the church, but by baptism or a legitimate transfer of membership from one like-minded church to another. God expects not just attendance, but membership and service through the church. That's, what, that's the point of the church and of the members of the body of Christ. Also, I want us to see here that the Christian can't just attend the church when it's convenient. The Christian must be careful not to idolize anything over God's command for the Christian to assemble with the church. And this includes parties or reunions. This includes family coming from out of town. Uh, this includes holidays. Uh, this includes sports events. Uh, this includes vacations. And this includes work. Uh, that nothing should be idolized above the church. Remember that something becomes an idol when it's revered higher than our Lord or than the will of our Lord, uh, higher than our relationship with God or higher than our obedience and service to God or than with meeting with our God as a church. I'm not saying here that, uh, that somebody should not let anything hinder his assembly with the saints. Okay, there are times, uh, as you know, Christ Himself pointed out, that on Sunday, when on on the Sabbath day, when your uh, animal is in a ditch, you can get it out of the ditch. Okay, I'm not saying that there's no occasion for somebody to miss church. However, a Christian with the right priorities will do his best to prevent circumstances and other people from causing him to forsake the assembling with the brethren. The Christian should never want to disobey a clear command of God, as well as missing out on God's blessings and provisions for him. You're not just disobeying God, you're also missing out on the blessings and provisions of God through the church that are only provided to you when you gather with the church. <clears throat> the husband must understand uh, in, in also that keeping his wife in church where she can have the fellowship of the saints and the preaching and teaching of God's word is the best way for him to sanctify and cleanse his wife. His wife needs church. And if you want the best for your wife, the best thing is for her to be in church. Uh, it's the best way for her to be nourished and, to cher and for her to be cherished. And it's the best way for the husband to help his wife to best glorify God is by bringing her to church, to be in the assembly that Christ has called us to be. And also, the best way for the husband to represent Christ 
and to be a witness to his wife's and his children's uh, friends and extended family is to express and to show the importance of his relationship with God, uh, to express with them the importance of his obedience and his service to God, and to express to his friends and extended family the importance of his meeting at church. That, I'm sorry, I can't miss church because you guys are coming from out of town. How about you come with us to church? And we all hear the preaching and teaching of God's word together. We should instead focus on the importance of church. That's the point of this passage. And so Paul's point here, uh, in closing, as the church is so important to Christ, concerning which he went to such a great extent to save and to prepare to glorify him in the future, the church should also be just as important to the Christian. The Christian must have the utmost care for, for having a proper relationship with his local church, uh, just like he should have the utmost care for having a proper relationship with his Lord and with his wife. And if the Christian wants to have a proper relationship with his Lord uh, and to properly glorify his Lord and to have the blessings of his Lord, he must be an active and contributing member of our Lord's church. That's the point of the passage here. And so in conclusion, today we saw uh, what's meant by the husband needing to love his wife as himself. And we saw how important Paul says that the church is, not just to our Lord, but how important the church should be to the Christian. And next week we're going to look at Paul's summary in the last three verses of this passage uh, related to the husband and the wife. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we have to spend in your word. Uh, we thank you for the power of it. We thank you for the clarity of it. We thank you that we have such a wonderful Lord and Savior uh, that has a purpose for our lives. And uh, we ask that you help us to glorify you uh, in our lives by especially our attendance and our participation in our church and that you'll be glorified in our church. And we ask that you'll bless the, the break and the hour to come of the preaching and teaching of your word and that you'll be honored and glorified in this meeting. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.